Good morning. I'm Kevin McAfee. I'm Zach Weeks. I'm Drew Foley. And we're your 2020 Boys Camp Directors. This year, we are celebrating 10 years of Just for Boys Camp. Thank you so much to all of you who have donated and prayed over this last decade, making camp possible for our community boys aged 7 to 12. Over the program's lifetime, hundreds of lives have been enriched each July. As a matter of fact, one of our directors, Zach Weeks, started out as an eight-year-old at boys camp in 2011. If you ask Zach, he will tell you that his life has been changed by this experience. Relationships are built between volunteer staff and campers every year, creating a bond that lasts a lifetime. A scriptural foundation is built into every year of camp, and this year's main verse is Romans 12, 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer, which couldn't be more fitting for our last few months. Camp may look a little different this year, but we are working very hard to follow the state's mandate of camp guidelines. Some of our activities include Man Sports Monday, fishing, hiking, swimming, boating, pottery, and cooking, just to name a few. By sponsoring a boy for camp, you give them an opportunity to build relationships, learn valuable skills, and have a whole lot of fun. The motto of Adopt-A-Block is to find a need and fill it, find a hurt and heal it. By sponsoring a camper today, you can change their tomorrow. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our online service. It's so great to worship with you this morning. As we go into a time of worship, I just want to read this verse that I think brings some true life to what we do and how we praise our God. It says this, and it's found in Exodus 15, 2. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. So just remember, even though you're still at home, we can still worship our God. And let's do that this morning as we sing.
A special part of our days so many times is the dedication of children. We love our families and we love being able to be a part of this very special moment and this very special prayer for our children. We thank God for every life and every young life especially and for every family. And so today it's my privilege and honor to dedicate our two children of Jared and Chelsea. We were just saying how it's been 10 years since we married them here it just seems like yesterday, guys, but it was a special time of our lives as weddings are, and now baby dedications and child dedications are very, very special. If Jesus was here, I'm convinced that I would want him to hold my children, grandchildren now, and love them and bless them and pray for them. What an experience that would be for everybody. Well, today we get to represent the body of Christ and to be his presence in today's world. And so it is my honor today to on behalf of Jared and Chelsea to thank the Lord for their boys and to dedicate them to the Lord. It's a very special time for them and for us as well. And so dearly beloved, 
you've brought these children whom God has given you to be dedicated to God and to his service. By this act, you therefore signify your faith in the Christian religion and also your desire that they shall receive the benefits of consecration to God and of the prayers of the church and may early learn to know and to follow God's will for their lives. But in order that this may be accomplished, it'll be your duty as parents to teach these children early the fear of the Lord and to watch over their education that they may not be led astray by false teachings or doctrines and to direct their minds to the Holy Scriptures as expressing the will and the authority of God for all mankind and to direct his feet to the, their feet to the sanctuary and to restrain them from evil associates and habits as much as in you lieth to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Will you endeavor to do so by the help of the Lord? If so, say we will. We will. Awesome. The scripture for us, coming from Mark's gospel, reads like this. And they brought the young children to him, to Jesus, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said to them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, and put his hands on them, and he blessed them. Well, that's one of my favorite parts of doing dedications with babies and children, is to be able to hold them, and love them and bless them. So we're gonna hold Cameron here. He's our, he's our little one right here, honey. Hi, Cam. Hi. Cameron's three months old. He's a little brother and a good one too, isn't he? And this is Thomas and he's six years old. Wow, he would grow fast. When you read our Bibles, we look at those stories of many of the old men and women of faith, the patriarchs of the Bible, who when they blessed their children, part of it was they held them or put their hands on them because there's something that says we love you about that, about a hug, about an affirming presence, about holding and knowing that, that somebody cares for us and that somebody is very close to us and special. And so today we want you to know that you're loved and so beautiful and so special every time you get a hug. Every time you get a hug, somebody loves you. Somebody believes in you. Somebody believes that God has put gifts and talents in your lives that we don't know about yet. We're yet to discover. But you've got all kinds of good things in you. All kinds and that we love you and your mom and dad and your families love you and how special you are. And we're yet to learn all that God can do through your life, but we believe in you. You've got a lot of good in you and you've got a great family around you that's gonna help and love and encourage you for that. And so we believe that God's got something for you that we're gonna, we're gonna be excited to watch as you grow and all the things we learn. Our world's kind of upside down today, isn't it? There's a lot of crazy things going on. We're going to need some good men to grow up and believe in God and believe in what God can do and believe in God can use you to help our world be all that he created it to be. And so it's my privilege today. We're going to pray for you, for both of you, for Cameron, for you. You have no idea who I am yet. And, and yet we're going to pray for you and we're going to pray for Thomas and dedicate you to God and say on behalf of your mom and dad that today we thank God for giving you this, giving us your life and for who you are. And we commit ourselves to pray for you and to love you and encourage you. Now, if it was like a normal church service, there would be all kinds of people out here in front of us in these chairs. Today, it's just us. But normally, they'd all be here. And normally, I would get them all to stand and they would join us in praying for you. And so as we pray today, you who are watching my video, if you'd like to reach out your hand towards the TV, 
and pray for Thomas and Cameron and join with us today as we hold them up to the Lord and thank the Lord for their lives and pray for their mom and dad and their family that together God would use them in a great way and bless them and be with them through all their lives. You go ahead and reach out towards your, however you're watching us today. And let's pray together for these young men. Now, Father God, today, we thank you for the moments in time when your blessing is extraordinary. Today, I hold the lives of two young men here in my hands. How thankful we are for Thomas and for Cameron for blessing our world and their family with these young men's lives. And Father, it is in the name of my Jesus that I hold them up to you and pray for them. Pray to God that as they grow, they would know the reality and the power of your presence and your love is so amazing for them that you would be their strength that they need and their hope that they need and the courage that they're gonna need to live for you. And Father, we pray for their mom and dad and their family. We love them all. And today, Father, we pray for God's blessing on their home. We're all going to need you, but it seems in our world that's upside down these days, we really need extra help from our God. And so may you help them to their love for you and for each other and for their children to be strong through each and every day. And for this promise and for these beautiful young lives that we commit to you, and consecrate to our God a dedication that, God, we're going to do our part and believe that you have great things for them. And so we ask this and pray this in the name of my Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you, sir. We love you guys. Okay, I have to give you a hug. God bless you. And Cameron, you too, pal. Great job. And mom and dad, God bless you guys. Proud of you. Bless you. Happy Father's Day to you. Here we are in the middle part of the month of June, and what a phenomenal week of weather we have had. We've been loving all the warmth and the sunshine. People's attitudes have been better. It seems like we're just enjoying the beauty of the season. And today, I'm looking forward to having barbecued hamburgers for lunch on Father's Day. What a great thing that's going to be. It's going to be good. And I can't wait to get home and have some lunch today. So we thank you for joining us again one more time and welcoming us into your home or wherever you are today, viewing our, our streamed service. This is our 14th week that we have streamed our church service for, for you and for all those who tune in from across the country. Friends and relatives are watching. Some of my friends in ministry, we all watch each other's services. And we want to say hi to all of you. And thank you for taking time to join this service and to join what God is doing. I believe God's always got a word for us, always has something to feed us and to feed our hearts and minds and to lead us to him. And so today we want to look into this and invite you to join in, in our time in God's word together. Today we're looking in the book of Acts chapter 3, right? The first 10 verses, Acts chapter 3. It's one of my favorite New Testament stories, New Testament healings that God does in the life of a crippled man. And it's one of our favorite stories to read and to think about and just dream about and, and envision what that must have been like that day in the city. And what does God have for us here? And trying to resist running off on any wild rabbit trails here and stories to tell. 
We're just looking at God's word today. And what is it that God is trying to say to us? What can we learn to apply to our life? What, what is God trying to show to us? Is, God, is there things in our heart that God needs to raise for us to be aware of? Are there things in our heart that we need to be able to give to him and let go of and say, God, this is for you. We want to live for you today. And, and, and how can we do that? And so let's learn God's word together today and, and see what God has for us and enjoy the time and the study of his word and focus on this story in Acts chapter 3. There are really two um, parts that we want to emphasize today in this story. And for these few moments this morning, I want to zero in on the early part or first part of the story about the crippled man. This has been in my, on my heart, and we've been working on this now for the last uh, several weeks, working through, and what does God have to say to us in this story and finding that today, given the dynamics and the events of the weeks in the last, in the, the events of our country in the last uh, few weeks, with all that is spinning around, all of the chaos, all of the riots, all of the protests, all of the questions and the stories, all of the frustrations. And we're saying with my wife here a few days ago that in the last 14 weeks, we seem to have gone through a time where we were all scared, and then we were frustrated, and then we were angry, and now it seems like most of us, myself included, we're just tired, and we're weary of all of this, and, and, and what are we going to do, and what, where, where's God, what's God doing in this time, and what can we do in, in this season where so many of us seem to be uh, getting weary of all of this. And does God have something to say for us? Well, yes, I believe. And matter of fact, no wonder. The word says, God's word says for you and I in Matthew 6, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Just think, he says to seek first the kingdom of God in the midst of all that we're dealing with and all that's going on in the world and the changes and the questions as to what the tomorrow and the days and months ahead are going to look like, that one verse alone is enough to keep us going and to keep us working on. In fact, if you don't get anything else out of these few moments in God's Word today, that's a great verse for you to feed in your heart and to learn and to grow, to seek first the kingdom of God. And God will look after the rest. You seek first His kingdom and His righteousness God's promise to look after us. Wow, that's a big verse for us. Well, no wonder the word reminds us of that. This old country, this old world, and me too, could sure enjoy and sure benefit from a great big bucket load of hope being dumped on us. We think it's funny, as hot as it has been in the last few days, to see the young fellows out there throwing a bucket of water on each other in an old-fashioned water fight. What if, what if we could just unload a whole bucket full of hope? Boy, we could sure use something like that today. Well, let's read this, the word and see what God has for us. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1, we'll start, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation today. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate. And so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. And Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. And Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the, lame, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And he jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. And then, walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. And the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. <laughs> yes, I bet they were. And praise the Lord for that story and for the powerful part of God at work. 
let's pull out some things here that help us today. Number one, I think hurts and healings both happen in different forms. Hurts and healings can both happen in different forms. Tradition tells us that this man being a crippled and a beggar was brought to the temple gates to beg for money or for alms or for something to help him through the day. And much of the tradition and historians tell us that he would not have been the only one at the gate, nor would he be the only one at any of the gates. For there was probably numerous people there knowing it was prayer time, knowing that churchgoers would be coming to the temple. Oftentimes those needing help and looking for begging opportunities would be there to look for help. It was a miracle. We cannot deny the miracle of what God did for this man. I want to push that a little further. I think it was more than just a physical miracle. It was a spiritual miracle that happened in this story. And who amongst us does not need God's touch in their life? We can connect with this story of the crippled man because hurts come in all kinds of forms and ways. There's people all around us today that are hurting. There's people who oftentimes feel overwhelmed, finding it hard to cope with life, stressed, and so many times the reaction of those people is just to pull back and withdraw and stay alone and isolate themselves. And what an incredible opportunity for God's people and for the church to be the presence in this world with so many hurting all around us, to hear them and to stand with them for justice, for equality, for mercy, for love and acceptance, to show in love and support in this critical time to people who so often are scared or hurt or tired or frustrated, and to go from just talking about it, but to be active and caring for, and helping, helping alongside these people all around us that need God to do a work in their life, just like you and I need God to touch our lives question we are asking as the title of our, our message today is who is at the gate or let's make it more personal who is it that's at our gates who is it around us as a church who is it around us as a church body of believers and the greater communities that you and I live in who is it all around us that is hurting that is waiting and expecting for some help that that you and I as God's people have this incredible opportunity to reach out to them and the help. You can't help but wonder about this beggar in our story, this crippled man. How many times did he hear people say to him, not today? I have to plead guilty of that. I've been in places where they're trying to make donations to one organization or one charity or another. And sir, would you like to give a, a couple of dollars to help this today? And man, too many times I said, no, not today. I wonder how many times the, the crippled man heard that. How many times did he have people say, no, not today. We're on our way. We're going in. We're going in. I want to speak directly for a moment to any of you who today feel like your life is hurting. Broken, maybe. Carrying a lot of pain and hurt. We've got to wonder if the man in the story, did he ever think nobody cares did he ever think there was no hope? Did he ever get discouraged and think this is all there is, one lousy day after another? Was this all it was? If today that's you, you're hurting, and you're wondering if anybody cares and if there's any hope, I wanted today to encourage you that God in his time and in his way can help to restore and rebuild and heal the hurts and the brokenness in your life too. And today I believe that God can use the, this story and this sermon and this time in God's Word to speak deeply into the lives and the areas of our hearts that are hurting the most and realize that there's hope that a God can come and begin to rebuild and reform and renew a life that's been broken by who knows what. God does a great work in His time. And more than ever, we as a church have to be working and intentional about creating connecting points 
with the people all around us and uh, that you see that are hurting and, and needy and need to know that there's someone cares and need to know that someone loves them and that there's hope and, and God in his time can rebuild and restore a life. Who is it that's sitting near the gates of, of your life? Don't miss the ones that are sitting near the gates of your home and your life and your work and our church all around us today. What a great opportunity we have in a world with all that's spinning to be people of love and acceptance and forgiveness and believing in the power of a God that can reach into a life and set us free and help us to build new lives, new lives. Many of us grew up watching Billy Graham crusades on TV with all the famous people in the crusades and they were a part of in my age group, anyway, it's part of our growing up. Even in the black and white TV days, when Billy Graham was on, we had to watch it. And they always closed singing the song, and we have sung it a number of times in our church as well. Just as I am, without one plea, but just as we are, but that his blood was shed for me, for you. The song says, that he invites us and bids us, come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. O Lamb of God, I come. Today into a hurting world, we hold out the light and the truth and the love of a God who is able to heal and rebuild and restore the brokenness and the hurt and the chaos into our life. And if we as a church and if the body of Christ around the world and around our communities can hold that out and be a part of reaching out and sharing that hope and love and encouragement and taking them by the hand like the Peter and John did in our story here, then somehow as we can do that, we're going to see God do amazing things in people's lives that only God can do and transformations and miracles and amazing acts of power that will testify to the God at work even in this crazy world that we think we're living in now. The miracle of Acts it teaches us some things. It's almost like it's, almost like it's a parable of some sort because there was more than taking place than just a physical healing. There was a spiritual healing. And into this world, one of my friends says, we live in a, in a bankrupt society with so much that seems empty. I believe this story is in the Bible to encourage us to rise up and to be that hand that reaches out to the hurting and to the lost and to the broken and rise up and in the name of Jesus to help them to stand and know that the power of God and the presence of God can be real in their life and bring wholeness and holiness and strength. And we can dream and pray and work towards that being experienced in people's lives today. And God calls us to that, to create mercy and love and amazing acts of, of power and and, and grace, Peter and John, it's interesting to me that Peter and John did not pray about what to do. And opportunities showed up. They, the beggar wanted to be cared for in, this, in, in the condition that he was in. He wanted some money. Peter and John said, we don't have any money. There's times when money is a good way to help. I get that. That's true. We've done that. But Peter and John said, it's not money. Look at us. And they offered and gave to him more than money could ever buy in the presence of a God. Here's the second thing, is that every encounter becomes a possibility for a miracle. They were going about a routine day, going about what their tradition had taught them to do, going to the three o'clock prayer. But every encounter could be a miracle that God could use you for. See, God's saying something, something to us through this season of whatever we want to call this, this COVID season or whatever you want to call it. I think God's saying some things to us. One of them could be that the, to, to show this world that we care, that the church is real, that God is real in the lives of the people and that we care and we need to shine like never before with a fresh sense of God's power and presence moving in us in ways that we're open to and want God to work. I heard the story, read the story, and heard it both about the uh, a revival that happened in Los Angeles back in 1906. Boy, you can tell I've been reading some history stuff. It was what is called the Azusa Revival, when a, when a man by the name of William Seymour, a one-eyed, 
34-year-old son of a former slave was invited to preach in a home. And there in that home, the fresh pouring out of God's Holy Spirit so swept in like the wind on the day of Pentecost that lives were being changed, people were being saved, healings and miracles were happening. And word got out and it got so crowded that even as people were gathered around the house to hear about what God was doing, they said the, the, the porch collapsed and they realized they couldn't continue the crowds and they moved to an old barn and for three years the fresh outpouring of God's Holy Spirit so flooded that area the thousands of lives coming from all over the world were impacted with what God was doing oh but for that kind of a fresh pouring out of his Holy Spirit in our midst today in our communities where we are somebody who said this and I copied it the basic call of the church is to release the life of God to declare the power of God and to make available to men what God can only do in the name of Jesus. That's what happened here in our story in the scripture. These people saw it and they were convinced that God was at work and they were prepared to listen. I don't always understand how God works, but I'm so glad that he does. It's interesting to me, one of those great questions that comes out of this story is if is that this crippled man was over 40 years old. And the chapter 4 tells us that, that he was over 40 years being carried there to beg for money. And if, given the timeline and the history, that would have meant that he would have been there someday when Jesus went into the temple. That he, Jesus would have seen. And why did Jesus not take time to heal this man? I don't know. I've got no answer for that. But I do believe that in God's time, God does God's work. And so this beggar looked to Peter and John on this day that we read the story of, expecting that they would help him. We'll talk a little bit about that more next week, about what do we expect from Jesus and how, how are we looking to him. But the problem we realize is that we can get so caught or trapped in, in complacency, in a rut, in our own routines, that, that we miss what God can do. We miss how God gives us those moments where we can interact with somebody. God's Holy Spirit can use us to touch and to change somebody's life. How many times had this man been carried to the temple? How many people did this man see? How many times did somebody say, I'm not giving to him today? How many times did somebody give to him to help him that day? How many times? And yet the complacency of just the routine it was interesting to me that this miracle did not happen in a church meeting. They didn't have, sing four songs and preach a long sermon and give an altar call and have this man come up to be healed. It didn't happen at all like what we think it has to happen. It happened outside the church. It happened at a moment when that encounter gave God an opportunity to work a miracle in this man's life and tell us about it so that you and I would understand that so often encounters, every encounter that we uh, in, uh, come, come to could be the possibility for a miracle. If you don't believe that, what do we do with this verse over in Ephesians? It says this, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power to at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Who's able to accomplish more than we might ask or think. We've got to believe. Look around you today. This week, look around where you are. You'll find some people hurting or searching or needing some love and grace. And look around to what God can do. Maybe today, this week, this month, it might be a time when God could work a miracle and you could be there for it. And it might just be that God would use you to help to care into the world that's, as we said, is going through all those emotions. And now a lot of us are just tired. And what? What now? What now? Maybe God can work a miracle through you. One of the great secrets about God working in the early church, and we know today, as a matter of fact, somebody said the secret sauce to life, the secret sauce to life is relationships. It's relationships. You know what a witness is. Somebody says, you know what, this was my life. I called out to God. I needed help. God did this in my life. My life has changed. It's no longer the same. My life is different because what God did, only God could ever do it, and I'll never be the same. And, and that's what God did for me. And we hear that witness, that testimony. And 
We say, well, if God did that for you, maybe God can do something for me. And it opens our hearts and helps us to be aware of what God can do and hear what God can do. And I think part of the significance of Peter and John's testimony that day when they reached out to this crippled man was that it wasn't just a story. This was a man, this, this was a crippled man whom Peter, Peter reached out, James, or John rather was with him. They, 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 their lives mattered. Their character mattered. You, you can smell a fake and a phony a mile away, but there was something authentic about them, something real about them. Our world's looking for the real stories from real people of a God who did a real work in their life. And when they hear that, God uses it to open their hearts to hear and to know what God can do. We're living in such an age of, of relationship poverty. I, we're just, we're, we can't get together in big groups. It's breaking our hearts. We, we love to get together with people. But part of the results of that, and they're studying all kinds of results of not being able to be together and the relationship poverty, is that we become complacent so easy. It's just me doing the same old thing, going to my world, not touching anybody. Nobody's touching our lives. And, and we become complacency and apathetic. And boy, in this world where we are so hungry for, Many of us are so hungry for relationships. With no large gatherings allowed, online ministry is awesome. You guys continue to encourage our staff with the great work they're doing. And I'm thankful for this opportunity to help spread the, God's word, not just to you, but literally around the world, our, our story's going. But we're hungry for relationships. Nobody can replace the authentic, I care. We're walking through life together and we're being together doing that. We need relationships. I think that's why God's word helps us. Romans 15, therefore accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. How pertinent that word is for today and for these weeks of turmoil and separation and anger and so many levels that we're seeing. How pertinent is this word from God to accept each other? I read in the Bible that Jesus died for the whole world to love us all. Relationships count. Peter and John looked at this crippled man and said, look at us. Look here. We've got something for you. Why did the disciples have such a presence and power? It's because when God fills you with his love you have, and have, you have nothing negative to say about any group, God's heart is open to everybody. And so for us to be filled with the word of God and with the love of people that our Jesus loved the people, Jesus died for everyone. Where are the people who want to love everyone? Where are the people who want to, regardless of race or position or age or status, who want to love everyone because that's how God is. Heaven, what an amazing scriptures we read about heaven. People there from every tribe and every nation. What an incredible place. A number of years ago, I was privileged to attend the General Conference of the Wesleyan Church. It was held that year down in Kentucky. And, and I was so thankful and honored to be able to be there. And in the celebration of missions that day, when there were missionaries and from around the world, but also there were people from countries all around the world who came in that morning, marched in, oft times in their native attire or ceremonial dress. What an incredible moving moment to think this is what heaven's going to be like. It's not... It's not just one or the other. It's all over the world. The one who says of every tribe and nation will be there. What a moment. What a moment. Where are the people who want to love everybody like Jesus loves everybody? Where are they? When the church stops giving, the church loses its power. It'll lose its power. There's a story back in the book of Ezekiel around the 36, 37 chapter. It's prophetic in its writings, I get that. It's a story, what you may know, is the Valley of Dry Bones, when the prophet, God led him out to a valley, and they looked across the valley, and all there was there was dry bones everywhere. And The famous question is, will these bones live? You can read those chapters in their extent and, and hear what God says and what the teaching was. Down in chapter 37 of that, 
of that chapter. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? I have to admit a little bit of me wants to say that with all these empty seats that I have in front of me this morning. We're missing you and we're missing being together. I walk around the sanctuary these days with just emptiness and empty seats. I pray, oh God, can these seats one more time live with the vibrancy of God's people and the vibrancy and the passion for God and the fullness of God's spirit doing a work amongst us and through us? Can these yet live again? Can these live again? God said in Ezekiel 37, verse 9, and he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, hold breath from the four winds and breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. We live in a world that is needing and searching and hurting in so many ways. And now you and I as the body of Christ get to step out into that world. The Bible calls us to be the salt, to add the flavor, godly flavor to the world. Godly flavor. Remember that verse I quoted at the start? To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To flavor the world with his kingdom and his righteousness. And then to be the light of the world. To showing the way, to guiding, to leading the way for others to know our God. It was asked of me again a few days ago, does all of this mean that Jesus is coming back soon? I said, in answer to that, I said, I really believe God is up to something. That he's working and we'll learn his ways. But God's up to something. I don't know what the answer is. Does it mean that Jesus is coming back right away? That's for him to know. I find some encouragement over in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. In those few chapters towards the end of the book of Matthew, it gives us some direction as to what end times or the last days will be like. And Jesus said these words to his disciples who said, are these the last days? Is this the, are these the signs? And Jesus said this, then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. I like this verse. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. So what do we say to wrap it all up? With those verses and this great truth of, of the story of the, the beggar who in many ways represents us, that God reaches in and does a miracle in his life and he celebrates and rejoices. What can we learn from that? And what's for us today is that we would say we can't give in to the pressures and the heartache and the stresses that are pulling so many away and breaking hearts. We're going to love others. We're going to do it God's way. We're going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we're going to live that and model that. And we're going to, we're going to live that way because we know it says here that he who endures to the end will be saved. And so don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Let's go back to Jesus. He's there for us. He's there to help you. He's there to be a part of your life and help us heal the hurts and help us solve the questions, help us to get through the days when we don't know what's going on next and to know that God can use us to, might just be the one that God chooses to work a miracle through your story of God's work in your life. Well, we're going to pray together today. And I thank you again for the privilege of sharing together with God's word. Hopefully this helps to encourage us. Hopefully this helps us to realize there's so many around us, like Peter and John, they didn't miss this crippled man. I don't want you to miss the opportunities that God has for you in a world looking to see if God's real. Let's get back to Jesus, a lovely world like he loved it, and watch what God can do.
And our Father and our God, we thank you for moments in your word. The richness of it continues to, to feed our hearts and minds and stretch us and teach us your ways. Oh God, for our people today, for all those viewing this, this time, help us to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Let's get back to Jesus. And love this whole world like Jesus loved it. And watch what God can do through people who say, here, it's my Jesus can change your life. And so we put this all in your hands today, Father. In my Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Can't wait to see you again. Bye now. Thanks again for joining us today. It was so wonderful to worship with you. Just two quick things before we close. First, remember next week we'll be doing communion. So don't forget to get your uh, juice and your bread so you can celebrate communion with us. And then secondly, I just want to wish all the fathers out there a wonderful and happy and safe Father's Day. Thanks for being those great dads that you're being. Have a great day. Thank you.